we'll just give a few minutes for everyone to join in. We'll be starting momentarily, everyone. Hey, Jordan, why don't we start? Sure. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of uh, the firm's quantum business law and quantum family offices, I would like to an extent a warm welcome to uh, everyone that's taken time out of their day to be able to join us on our program. So today we'll be talking about some important issues within estate planning and tax planning that are affecting Canadian businesses, Canadian family businesses in 2023. And so first I'd like to introduce the speakers that are presenting today as part of our expert panel. So we have Todd Louis, who is the senior partner of Quantum Business Law. And so for the last 30 years, Todd has uh, been at the forefront of uh, tax planning and corporate restructuring strategies here in Canada. And during that time, he has uh, spoken at various events such as the Ontario Bar Association, Association for Estate Lawyers, as well as um, multiple CPA associations in various jurisdictions here in Canada. Secondly, we have uh, Andy Yip, who is uh, a senior associate with Quantum Business Law, and he's, in, he's an experienced tax lawyer that uh, works on the uh, corporate restructuring team of Quantum Business Law. And then for myself, I'm the Client Relationship Director of, of Quantum Family Offices, mainly in estate planning. And so at this point, I'd like to introduce the topics that we'll be speaking on. So firstly, we'll be speaking on a few different tax changes that are coming into effect or have came into effect recently, such as uh, uh, reporting requirements for verifiable transactions. Secondly, we have uh, capital gains tax planning issues. So we'll be speaking on various uh, corporate structures, as well as strategies that can be implemented to um, otherwise reduce or prepare for capital tax, capital gains tax liabilities that uh, take place during the lifespan of businesses, as well as other assets. And um, then we'll be speaking on uh, general anti-avoidance rules and changes that have been made to GAR penalties. Um, from there, we'll be speaking about asset protection issues, so ways to be able to reduce exposure, not only for corporate assets, but also personal assets. Then we'll be speaking about um, different issues within life insurance planning. And lastly, we'll be speaking about uh, low-cost capital lending for areas such as uh, multi-residential real estate and, and really just sort of how the, how the high interest environment here in Canada, as well as uh, in other jurisdictions, is affecting um, both investment structures and, and family businesses. So to start with, as uh, one of the large tax changes that have came into effect was uh, the substantive Canadian controlled private corporation rules and really the, the definition of uh, substantive CCPCs. And so, um, Andy, did you want to shed some light just as to, as to how this definition has changed and how it really affects some of the different structures that we see here in Canada? You're sorry, muted. I think you're, I think you're oh, muted. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so uh, I suppose the concept of substantive CCPC was introduced uh, as a response to the difference in um, the tax on investment income between CCPCs and non-CCPCs. 
So as uh, some of our, our audience might know, uh, non-CCPC is subject to a lower tax rate, such that it doesn't, it's not subject to the surtax or uh, the refundable tax, unlike CCPCs. Um, as a response to that, so the Department of Finance introduced this uh, substantive CCPC concept where basically non-CCPCs will be treated as uh, non-CCPCs for purposes of uh, calculated investment income. So um, when a non-CCPC is controlled directly or indirectly in any manner by uh, one or more Canadian resident individuals, then it could be deemed as a substantive CCPC. And that is controlled by uh, the jury, in fact, or, or by uh, or, or by de facto. And the second part of that is if each of the capital stocks of a corporation owned by a Canadian resident were owned by a particular individual, it could also be uh, uh, be controlled by that particular individual. So what that means is if all uh, Canadian individual shareholders, um, they have an aggregate uh, level of shares uh, that could be uh, constitute control to the corporation, it would be deemed by control by one individual. So even though it's widely spread, um, it might not be controlled by any particular individual or groups, it could still be deemed as a substantive CCPC under this definition. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, add to that uh, a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. For those of you who are not tax geeks, I just would like to define uh, what we're really talking about here. And ultimately, there is, as Andy mentioned, a reduction of tax on passive income, income that's not earned through an active business uh, or is not earned uh, through active business activity in Canada. Uh, also, another example of that is capital gains. So if you have a corporation that holds real estate as an example, and then you were to sell the real estate, well, the typical tax that you'd expect to pay is about 25% within that corporation. And if you are to earn passive income, in other words, income from investment activity, regular income is taxed typically at 50.17%. Sorry, investment income is taxed at 50.17%. In as, a, as kind of an average in most provinces. Well, if your company is not Canadian controlled, it's a foreign controlled company, well, you don't have to pay uh, what Andy referred to as the federal surtax, which is really a refundable tax that you company would get back at a later time when it pays dividends. They get that back a portion at a time. But ultimately, the company is out of pocket this larger amount that relates to quite a high tax rate. Well, uh, in, 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 conversely, if you have a non-Canadian controlled company and you don't have to pay that tax, what happens is your tax on uh, passive income is reduced from over 50% to the general rate, which is only 26 and a half percent, big reduction. Well, if you sell a property, as an example, you have capital gains through a corporation where your tax rate is, um, little more than 50% of what it would have been. It's like a little bit over 13% instead of 26% uh, or 26 and a half. And that is the fundamental difference. So what happens is a lot of times there's been um, a lot of popularity over the last several decades in tax planners, accountants, lawyers, and other individuals who thought they could become creative and come up with a scenario where a company which is not in Canada, can earn this income? Well, I'd suggest that in most cases, there, there has been, um, I think, uh, an abuse of this legislation, in my view at least, insofar as there's been an artificial mechanism used in order to achieve that. In Canada, well, in common law jurisdictions, we have a, a principle that I think needs to always be in the back of our mind, and that is the concept of uh, controlling mind and management. And of course, the application of that is not restricted only here. We see that in a lot of different areas, but what it really means is if you're a Canadian, you're a resident of Canada, Can Canadian taxpayer, you own a company in another country, and that, comp that country, that company is controlled by you, well, that is deemed to be a Canadian corporation uh, in, in, in quite a genuine sense. But rather than doing, uh, rather than being aware of that, I think what we've seen a lot of planners do 
is they have actually moved companies from, say, Ontario, BC, or Alberta to a U.S. jurisdiction like Delaware, or Wyoming, or some other place, uh, sometimes British Virgin Islands. And essentially, they still maintain control of that company. Well, that is not, uh, that is not uh, a foreign-controlled company. The company is still controlled by individuals here in Canada. So in effect, what's happened with these substantive CCPC rules is CRA has sought to really put an end to that. It's not that that planning wasn't challenged before, it was, but now it's very big, uh, high on the radar. So if you have a company that's located outside of Canada or you have a trust outside of Canada or a holding company outside of Canada, it's very, very important that it's genuine and not artificial, in my view at least. So that's kind of the background. Thank you for those comments. And so, I mean, really just to sort of recap on what we discussed now, we're just going to talk about some of the different qualities or really benefits and disadvantages that the, that the three different categories of, uh, of uh, corporations would, uh, would enjoy or, or would be negatively affected by. So when we're talking about uh, Canadian controlled private corporations, like uh, Todd and Andy had mentioned, so I mean, some of the benefits that the structure would have is firstly, that uh, the lifetime capital gains exemption would be there for qualified small business corporation shares or QSBC shares, and so we'll get uh, we'll, we'll we'll speak about what uh, some of those qualify what some of those qualities would mean, really, just sort of uh, with some specific examples later on, and then also there's an enhanced benefit for research and development tax credits. Um, the disadvantages of the CCPC is that uh, there would be no small business. Oh no, yeah, there'd be no small a type, typo. Yeah, it's typo. That's a typo, actually. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, it would be subject to refundable tax on investment income. Yes, yeah, so you you do have a small business. Today. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. So that was a typo. Our apologies for that. Right. And then um, next, um, did you gentlemen want to uh, describe just some of the benefits and disadvantages for non CCPCs? Well, I, th I think what's important, you know, is to consider that we don't live forever. As negative as that concept may be, uh, all of us at a certain age become aware of our mortality. And it's not just other people that die, it's our loved ones and, and our, our, ourselves. So in coming to that awareness, it's always wise to make plans. Um, in other instances, you know, you may be planning to sell your company and you may be planning a liquidity event. You may look at uh, possibly being purchased by a competitor or large large company somewhere you may be issue, thinking of issuing an IPO and going public all of those things uh, mean that it's fairly important to consider how you can reduce the tax bite at death right so in Canada uh, you know we we have legislation in place that states that uh, at the time of death we've deemed to have disposed of our assets and of course we we have a lot of people that uh, are getting advice that doesn't necessarily take that into account. We had some people a couple of days ago that have very significant to state and they said, well, listen, we have gone ahead, we're doing this planning and uh, the individual's relative is, uh, is uh, gifting the assets uh, based on love and affection, believing that there would be no tax consequences. Well, in that particular situation, we had uh, you know, a, a, uh, a lawyer that was depending on uh, accountant to provide tax advice and accountant was depending on the lawyer to do the same thing and obviously there was a bit of a misunderstanding on what happens and of course we managed to circumvent that situation and prevent them from moving forward and when they realized that they were triggering tax well they said well that's not our goal so what else can we do so we you know took so looked at it a little closer and we said well look there are some things that can be done we can transfer that real estate into a corporation and we can issue the shares you know say the uh, growth shares or common shares to family members or trust or what have you essentially at the time of death well the tax bite is reduced to the value that exists today so what you're really doing is you're deferring the tax bite and most of the time that's the goal I mean why would anyone want to pay tax today if it can be paid later you know, we've heard people say, oh, why make it complicated? It's only a deferral. But if the deferral is decades, it's not a terrible thing. So when you consider what the you know, time value that money represents, the investment opportunity that gets lost when you're paying it in tax, 
and quite possibly there could be other ways of mitigating the tax on death as well. So really, we're, I think that uh, the lifetime capital gains exemption is one of those points that uh, you know a lot of people just discount. The other problem with capital gains exemption is a lot of people believe that it's automatic. We'll get into that later, but it's not. But in order to qualify for that capital gains exemption, which is just under a million dollars or so per individual right now, and it may be numerous individuals holding shares, either directly or indirectly through a trust, well, I think it's something that's important to consider. So the question is, uh, do you require a capital gains exemption in a specific company? And if you have a non-Canadian controlled private corporation, uh, you do not have a capital gains exemption there. And on non-Canadian controlled private corporations, you also do not have a small business deduction. So that is correct. Um, so the is other issue is, is that you do have a much less uh, benefit uh, for uh, scientific research and experimental development tax credits. Federal government has uh, a treat, uh, legislation treats Canadian controlled corporations in a more favorable way. So all of those things I think are very, very important in uh, getting proper advice to determine whether or not it would even benefit you to have such a status within the company. Uh, it's really, um, question of fact, who controls the company, and we can get to that later. Those are, in my view, the benefits and dis disadvantages of a non-Canadian controlled co private corporation. And I, I noticed as well, there's some questions, some, some questions that were left, but uh, we'll be getting to the questions just after the program's finished. We'll have a, a short uh, question and answer period afterward. And um, so next we'll be talking about, yeah, again, revisiting substantive CCPC rules. And so I, did notice here it's a sort of a, a little bit of a formatting error, <laughs> just as uh, the main problem really was that substantive CCPC is that once once this qualification has been made, really all of the benefits of of both CCPCs and non CCPCs would be lost essentially. So there would be no small business deduction that would be available for for corporations that are that are classified as substantive CCPCs. There's no enhanced uh, benefit for uh, research and development for for research and experimental development tax credits, and there would be um, no additional tax benefits that would be given through a substantive through, through, through a corporation that's classified as a substantive CCPC in terms of uh, non in terms of uh, federal fundable tax. And again, there would be no lifetime capital gains exemption. For, for QSPC shares. Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking maybe Andy, you might want to elaborate just a little bit on a certain, uh, I gave an example of what is called a continuance and in, in the event that uh, CRA picks up on this, maybe from a, I'm gonna say from a tax dispute point of view, you know, you might give uh, the audience here some idea of what kinds of events might trigger CRA's attention in whether or not they apply these rules? Um, well, generally, in, when in an audit, whether you're looking to the status of um, the corporation, whether CCPC or not CCPC, it, it, it really comes down to two or three main areas. One is the uh, lifetime capital gains when you claim them. Uh, the second is usually what happened is, is uh, uh, small business deduction. So when, when they're like two groups where um, they, they are they might not be share control legally, but the CRA would uh, eh, like assert that they 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 are uh, they share de facto control together and they deny small business deductions, uh, even though maybe they are even though they might not. Obviously, they are deeming rule under the uh, small business deduction uh, rules as well. And the third area is is, is um, the uh, sorry, I lost my train, train of thought. But um, yeah, th those are the main areas where, where, where these status might be challenged. But the uh, introduction of sub substantive CCPC would introduce a huge risk to adopt non CCPC structures. So, for example, where um, Corporation is mostly owned by Canadians, but they're artificially made into a non CCPC by uh, various methods such as uh, wide shareholding, but uh, 
maybe a foreign shareholder owns most of the shares, but does not uh, inst uh, constitute actual control. But the uh, Canadian shareholders, they spread out the control artificially. Or B, maybe they put uh, the control under a foreign corporation or a foreign entity, which is in fact controlled by a Canadian resident. Uh, that that would be considered artificial uh, control as well. So uh, I suppose the introduction of substantive CCPC is mainly to combat those uh, more artificial structure and, and to strip the uh, tax benefit of the from the non CCPC uh, uh, like in investment income. Yeah, I mean the British Virgin Islands uh, may be a very nice place to visit, but there are individuals that have such companies, uh, no members of their corporation, no officers, no shareholders, directors, employees, or otherwise have ever been there. <laughs> they have no substantial presence there. And I, I think the word artificial is a very good, good word to describe that. And I think we have to be very careful, you know, when you're doing planning that, uh, you know, that there's no particular purpose for that uh, company to exist in that jurisdiction, other than to manipulate status of the company to pay 50% less tax. That's really what we're worrying about. But I will say that there is uh, certain instances, and sometimes it goes back to intent. In other words, if the intent is to um, purchase properties and you know uh, resell them to, uh, and reduce the tax on that, there's often situations where CRA will flag these uh, companies on the basis that there was a change of status followed by a capital gain that was less. So anyway, without belaboring this, because we could actually spend our full hour on this one subject, it's very important for those of you who have these kinds of structures to have them looked at. There are things that can be done in order to better fireproof your tax planning, to ensure that you're not vulnerable, vulnerable to an assessment, and to ensure that in the event that you do have a capital gain, you don't have C at your CRA at your door challenging the amount of tax you just paid. <laughs> Uh, that would be most unfortunate, right? So anyway, uh, why don't we move on from here, Jordan? Sure, absolutely. So the the next new change that we wanted to discuss was some of the new trust reporting roles, which are, which are quite, quite closely related. We're talking about corporate corporate structures, common corporate structures that we see. Um, so uh, Andy, did you want to comment a little bit on, on the two different roles that we have pictured here? Um, sure. I guess the um, biggest change is, is that Trust will now have to file T3s if they have uh, assets in excess of fifty thousand uh, dollars. Well, after the uh, this year, uh, and the second rule is they you have to report all trustees, beneficiaries, and set law uh, in the return. And I suppose one of the biggest um, ramification is, is that if there are like aggressive tax planning structures, you uh, utilizing trust, then uh, it would be a lot easier for the CRA to track uh, whether, like for example, two corporations are uh, share de facto control or are they related, affiliated, uh, or what not. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that this is a, an area that's a little bit contentious because at the end of the day, uh, you know, I perceive this as an invasion of privacy. Um, having said that, my opinion doesn't matter very much uh, to the legislature and otherwise to. Um, uh, OECD countries around the world that have all adopted these policies uh, in order to prevent uh, base erosion, so on, uh, of existing tax uh, regi uh, regimes in various different countries. So at the end of the day, the issue must be, you know, that uh, these countries have adopted this and they're using the tax uh, system in our country here in Canada in order to expose uh, the identity of people who would normally prefer to remain nameless. And uh, typically, uh, beneficiaries of a trust is one thing that I think really works against the interest of, uh, of uh, tax uh, individuals in Canada that are doing conscientious and uh, clean and clear sort of planning, where they have very good reasons sometimes uh, not to make known who the beneficiaries are. Oftentimes, they don't want the beneficiaries themselves to know. Uh, we've all seen cases of family infighting and much of the tax planning that uh, wealthy families in Canada do um, is often uh, done in order to avoid conflict within families and other things. Uh, the identity of 
the uh, settler, uh, arguably is kind of irrelevant. A settler has a ceremonial role, uh, generally speaking, when he contributes a small sum of cash, perhaps a $10 bill or a $100 bill in order to settle a trust. And essentially that would be the, the end of that wall all of a sudden now, where you might have otherwise had individuals that you could say, well, look, you know, your role is short-lived. You contribute the $10 or whatever it is, you settle the trust and that's it. Well, now there's a requirement to report who the settlers are. So I think in general, it doesn't really serve the interests that it was intended. It basically causes a, a certain breach of privacy that I don't think is appropriate. But nonetheless, there is this requirement uh, for reporting of, of trust regulations, of trust uh, parties to a trust. Whether it makes sense or not is a different story, but it's a reality. Yeah, thank you for the comments. We'll be revisiting uh, trust structures what, uh, like after the, the next subject as well. So um, the, the next uh, tax change that we wanted to discuss was uh, new mandatory reporting rules for uh, verifiable transactions. And so, um, Andy, did you want to shed some light just as to how this rule change is affecting transactions here in Canada? Yeah, well, this is a big subject in the tax community. Uh, the for the, for the introduction of the notifiable transactions and the changes made to the reportable transaction rules. So um, I guess, well, we, we go slide by slide, but um, so the for, for notifiable, notifiable transactions, basically it's a set of prescribed transactions where uh, it's designated by the Minister of National Revenue. And if you enter into one of such a transaction, you're supposed to notify the CRA within uh, 45 days. Um, for uh, reported transactions, which we'll cover next slide, but for both of them, the reassessment period has actually been suspended until the, you actually file the the, the uh, reporting the, or, or the report. Because um, normally, a uh, reassessment period is around like three, four years, dep depends on, on the taxpayer. But uh, this could uh, lead to a scenario where the reassessment period has never started. Uh, uh, it could be decades uh, and you never notice and the CR could still reassess you, which obviously bring in a significant risk to, to um, the aggressive like transactions or tax, tax structures. But um, personally, I don't think it's a very uh, reasonable. Uh, I think that should be capped, but um, that, that, that's what these changes are suggesting. So for reporting reportable transactions previously or currently actually, um, not previously, I, I think it just went, went to effect like uh, yeah, June 22nd, sorry. Uh, it, it's two, two, uh, you have to hit two hallmarks out of the three mm -hmm. in order to cause the transactions to become reportable. So um, I'll just cover them quickly. The first one is uh, advisor promoter, promoter uh, receiving a fee that's based on the amount of tax benefit or contingent upon obtaining a tax benefit. Uh, the second one is where an advisor promoter uh, obtain confidential protection uh, with respect to the tax treatment in, re in relation to the avoidance transaction. The third one is uh, a person, advisor, or promoter has or had contractual protection in respect of the transaction. So previously, you only hit, need to, you have to hit two out of three hallmarks in order to cause a, a transaction to be reportable, but now it's the only one. So it really covers a lot of uh, different types of transaction that could you, uh, previous people never expected to be reportable, but now it could be become reportable. Uh, for example, um, if a transaction is, um, let's say, some sort of NDA uh, uh, related to it, it could, if you look at the structure as a whole, it could potentially cause the transaction to be reportable just because you're hitting that um, confidential protection hallmark. Uh, yeah, if we can go to the next slide. I just just before you leave yeah. there, I'm just going to comment that in reality, you know, because the transaction is reportable, it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing to do. Um, income in general is reportable, expenses are reportable, and uh, there are certain transactions that may hit that hallmark for one or more reasons uh, that uh, may still be a prudent thing to consider. Having said that, there are other transactions which are highly aggressive. And it's our view that the aggressive transactions should not have taken place to begin with. So where we see, you know, individuals that are, you know, seeking tax deductions in excess of the amount of their investment, as an example, 
Well, it doesn't take a genius to know that's something that CRA would not uh, look favorably on and the courts would not look favorably on. The other issue, and, and, and that's respect, irrespective of who's giving you an opinion. So at the end of the day, you might have somebody say, well, we've been doing this for 25 years. We've never had a challenge, Well, you don't want to be the first one on the 26th year. So in reality, it's very, very important uh, to be diligent on your own. And sometimes it's common sense, you know, to say, well, so the one example uh, I've given you, another example, uh, I've mentioned the term artificiality a little bit. I'm not sure that that's a real word, but nonetheless, say as an example, someone was to come to you and through your lawyer or accountant, wouldn't matter, because ultimately business, and I know a lot of you are, are lawyers and accountants, but if you're a business owner, you have someone coming in and saying, look, you know, we'll offer you a capability to buy class A shares in, a, in, a, in an entity. And the class A shares are tied to a currency. And the second one, you buy class B shares. So if there's a differential between the performance, which there always is, it will naturally create a loss. Well, that loss will be a deduction for you. Well, ultimately, there's always going to be one loss position. There's always going to be some differential between the performance. And it doesn't have to be a currency. It can be anything else that is used as sort of a tracking mechanism or indicator. So I think it's always wise to ask yourself, is this a legitimate business intent? Or is there something there that somebody who, who, who was very clever, you know, thought up to, to uh, deceive the tax department? So since these transactions have to be looked at, ask yourself whether or not there is a legitimate reason for the benefit you're receiving. If not, I would stay away as far as possible from any such proposal, irrespective of who it comes from and how much you may or may not respect the individual who's presenting it or those who are advising you. Yeah, thanks, for the, thanks for those comments. I think um, just on a very closely related note, um, one subject that we wanted to discuss was really just some of the some of the amendments that took place regarding the general anti avoidance rules in the uh, 2023 budget, and so one of them is really broadening the definition of avoidance transactions themselves. And so I'll read that out just quickly. And so originally it was uh, for purposes for primarily for bona fide purposes other than to obtain a, a tax benefit. And so this has now been changed to to one of the main purposes was to obtain a tax benefit for the type of transaction. And so um, and so now, so even if uh, there was a, even if there was a purpose, and like uh, in addition to adding a tax benefit, if the tax benefit was, was really one of the main priorities, then in that case, this type of transaction can be labeled as, a, as an avoidance transaction. And so um, did the panel want to comment at all just in terms of how this definition might change this type of planning going forward? Well, for those yeah. of us that have been around for uh, tax for a number of years, well, we always see this, uh, you know, situation where, you know, CRA and the, you know, finance and, you know, and inevitably the legislature, you know, uh, making you see changes that are being made in order to deal with unfavorable court decisions and so on. Also, trends are also very, very important. And, you know, of course, I think it's important if we're talking about GAR that we understand, you know, the, 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 the framework for GAR. So maybe what I'll do is before we open this to comments, I'll just say that in general terms, concept of GAR deals with anti-avoidance rules that are intended to deal with situations where an individual has derived a tax benefit, where the sole purpose originally now being changed to one of the purposes, where the bona fide reason for doing so was to gain a tax benefit, where there was an abuse or misuse of the legislation. And these is, this has now been changed to say, well, it's no longer necessary to say that uh, you, there must be uh, a, the, the primary bona fide purpose was to have a tax benefit. It could be one of the purposes. Well, at the end of the day, the problem that we have is a couple of things, and it's always wise to consider that in the event that we have a tax assessment other than a few issues, such as gross negligence penalties and other things, the burden of proof is on the taxpayer in order to uh, essentially 
if we're, if we're in tax court, it would be to abolish assumptions. So when you get an assessment from CRA, well, they make certain assumptions and those assumptions, ultimately, if you have a tax dispute, you would have to refute them, you have to prove them wrong. It's a little bit of an issue there because of the fact that we have a, a reverse onus, if you will, to the burden of proof being on the taxpayer to demonstrate that. That means CRA can say, okay, well, you one of the reasons you did it was this was for such and such, for tax savings, as an example, tax avoidance, where you say, well, no, it wasn't. So it ultimately increases the risk of some kinds of transactions. So it's not that uh, it can't be defended. It always can be. Um, I think at the end of the day, when you're doing something where you have a tax benefit, it doesn't, again, it doesn't take a tax expert to be able to consider whether or not there's a probability that one of the purposes you did it was to avoid tax. It may result in tax savings, but is that something that if you were, if there's two, you or yourself and your lawyer and accountant at, the, at a table and say, say one or two partners, say half a dozen of you, rather than six of you pretend there's a seventh person, pretend that seventh person is sitting at one of the seats at this table. How would that person view the conversation always? And I, I'm suggesting that for lawyers and accountants too, by the way. I'm suggesting that always temper our advice based upon the way that CRA will see it. I always believe that it would be very, very good if all individuals involved with tax planning was forced to do tax dispute for five years. <laughs> then you realize the impact of your planning. You know, because it's always easy to say, oh, uh, you know, it's worked for me before, so I'm recommending it to you too. But that might be the very worst advice to give. So I always consider that uh, the objectivity of the uh, way that we look at things, in particular, putting ourselves in that position of an onlooker from the CRA has always been something that's been beneficial for, for people to have a clear vision of those things that sometimes are too complicated. You pull them down. Was that one of the main purposes? Or is it just a natural consequence of what you did? If it's a natural consequence of what you did, is very different than being a main purpose. So just the, just the way that we tend to look at this kind of planning. I'll make a quick comment as well. Um, God cases are rarely a clear cut case, but uh, this change really created this big gray area uh, where just due to the fact that naturally parties are going to want to do a transaction the most tax efficient way. So can you really say that um, by doing so or trying to be tax efficient or, or pay the least taxes uh, possible, is the, 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 the one of the main purposes is to obtain a tax benefit? Or, uh, I mean, it's not reasonable to ask taxpayers to pay more than their fair share of taxes, but if they just want to pay what they think is, well, minimize that based on the current tax legislation, is it really causing a, transaction to become uh, one of the main purposes to obtain a tax benefit. So uh, we will see how, how this change plays out in, in court, but it could potentially lead to very unreasonable um, results. I agree 100%, Andy. You know, and, uh, one of the things that I always you know revert back to is the uh, fundamental basis or the framework on which the guard uh, system exists in Canada. And of course, uh, most of you are probably familiar with the story of the gardener who was being paid uh, bi-weekly. And of course, at the time in England, uh, the Duke of Westminster uh, received some tax advice that had the effect that instead of paying uh, bi-weekly, well, what you'll do is you'll pay annually, but pay the, make the payments in installments of, say, 26 installments or something like that. Anyway. Bottom line was the tax authorities were unimpressed completely with what he did. And essentially there was a decision uh, by the um, uh, courts and it was it's been quite uh, fortunately adopted into our tax system here where uh, the, the concept of the Duke of Westminster is something that's very important to consider. And that is the decision went along these ways in rather a poetic fashion. But every taxpayer has the right, and I'm paraphrasing, to order his affairs in a fashion where he pays a lesser amount of tax, irrespective, irrespective of whether or not 
his conduct is looked at favorably by the tax department or his fellow man. <laughs> anyway, that is uh, the fundamental concept of uh, GAR and how it basically, you know, came about to say, okay, th this is our fundamental right is to pay less tax. Tax avoidance is not a criminal offense. It's not an offense of any kind. Uh, tax evasion is a criminal offense, which is something that at all times, everyone should do everything they can to stay as far away from as possible. But as Andy said, why should someone have to take a position that forces them to pay more tax? If there's two roads and you're in both roads are viable roads, why should you have to go on the one that cause more tax? So I, I think that the concept is, is quite correct. And of course the case law that we have that defines this even better, where GAR was really defined as the three rules. This is under a case called Canada Trust Co versus Her Majesty the Queen. It had the three part test that I referred to again. You know, is there a tax benefit? Is there a misuse or abuse of the legislation? Well, again, you know, you don't have to be a tax expert to understand what an abuse is or what a misuse is of the existing legislation. You do not have to be, and of course, what this whole concept of a bona fide purpose is case law that we would stand, we still still exists. It's still a case that's cited, you know, all the time. It's the, it's the you know, it's the flagship case. So that now, of course, we're changing this to say one of the benefits. So then it comes back to a, a, a question of whether the result was just a natural result, or whether in fact it was one of the one of the uh, purposes. So it's very be very interesting to see the way the case cases uh, play out. But uh, I think that erring on the side of caution is always smart from that point of view. Thank you. Yeah, just yeah, just to cover the other changes. So uh, they also added the preamble uh, stating that the uh, God, God could apply to where there's a tax benefit, whether the tax benefit was foreseen at the time of transaction. Uh, the other thing is they added a 25% penalty equal to the tax benefit if God is applied. And I think the most egregious one, if I can use that word, is the extension of the normal reassessment period by, by three years. And I, I do think it's very unfair to taxpayers if the CR could just slap a guard on um, on uh, um, well, audit or, or or dispute, even though they missed the reassessment period, and they would just slap a guard and automatically extend for three years. So it, it obviously wastes a lot of taxpayer resources. Even if you at the end you win in tax court based on that the guard does not apply, you still waste so much resources just to fight the CRA on it. It could be like hundreds of thousands of dollars or legal costs. So uh, I personally, I think out of all the changes, that one is the most egregious one. Yeah, agreed. Thank you. And so we'll be moving on to our next subject then in this case. So now I'll be speaking about um, all types of transactions related to trust planning specifically. And so all of these are aimed at uh, deferring or avoiding the imposition of tax on 21 year deemed disposition of trust property. Big issue here. I think, I think there's a, uh, you know, not only uh, this whole concept of uh, the disposition rule creates confusion, but I think it, it also causes a lot of people to refrain from doing effective tax planning. Um, the whole concept of the 21 year disposition rule uh, does not take away the value of a trust, I don't think, in my view. Um, current legislation does, in some instances, provide us the capability to be able to do a complete new refreeze at the end of the 21 year period, subject to, um, I'm going to say, a freeze being done properly. But in reality, uh, there is a requirement to. Uh, for a trust to dispose of or otherwise roll out the assets uh, prior to the 21st year. So I'd say that this is not uh, new, but I'd say that this is important um, for everyone to be aware of the fact that this entire issue uh, needs to be really thought of, but not as a deterrent to doing proper planning. So if you're, you know, say uh, successful, your company's growing, you have a family, being aware of your mortality, as I said before, uh, 
or having plans to achieve a liquidity event that may be uh, quite uh, valuable for your family, it's very, very important to look at how you can use a trust in a, in a sense in order to kick the can down the road one generation. Again, the idea is that tax has to be paid to things that are uh, facts in life and death and taxes. We're not disputing that. But again, it can mean intergenerational wealth transfer, which does not trigger tax at that time. Being really getting the proper advice is what's key on this one. Good. And um, just to move forward to our next um, transaction uh, regarding the uses of trusts. Um, so Andy, did you want to speak uh, regarding uh, tax deferred distributions of trust property to uh, Canadian resident corporate beneficiaries? Uh, sure. Yeah, this slide and the last slide, I believe it's the examples given by the uh, Department of Finance uh, on what they plan to add to the list of notifiable transactions. So, so for, for this one, it uh, they give an example where uh, there's a tax deferred distribution of property from a Canadian resident trust to a Canadian resident corporate beneficiary where one or more non-resident beneficiaries own share in that beneficiary. So um, obviously a uh, uh, direct distribution to non-resident -ben non beneficiaries are directly uh, taxable. But uh, so what, what the people you usually do to get around that is to set up a corporation and a corporation be owned by that non-resident. Or well, the shares of the corporation be owned by the non-resident. So uh, it, it's interesting that the fi finance decides to uh, add that to the list to the um, notifiable transaction. But uh, uh, my, my guess it would be uh, makes their life easier on enforcement of uh, the the tax to the non-resident where, where it does distribute, and there are other taxes such as withholding tax that they could track and, and, and things like that. They're perfect, perfect. Of course, we're talking about a tax-free rollout here from a trust um, to, to a, a, an individual and the requirement being that that, that uh, beneficiary must be a resident of Canada in order for it not to attract tax. And that's basically it. So that uh, concept is, uh, I think, still quite common. And since the company is a Canadian resident taxpayer, I don't know that CRA would be successful in attacking that. But nonetheless, perfect. they won't. But, right. I think it's the reporting requirement that that is most uh, onerous. Um, and because it's just one or more non-resident beneficiaries. So even if a corporation is quite widely held, as long as there's one or more non-resident beneficiaries, the, the role that will still be subject to the reporting rules. Yeah, perfect. Okay. And um, we're, we're getting close to the one o'clock mark. And on that note, I just uh, really quickly wanted to change subjects and just speak uh, regarding some potential some potential problems with common structures that we see and solutions that uh, that can be implemented to be able to solve them. So I just wanted to talk about this uh, potential case study that we have here. And so Andy and Todd, are you able to see any just sort of potential hazards or liabilities that might arise in this common structure? Well, I, th I think there's a few issues in this diagram that would present more questions and answers, first of all. So you have a Canadian, a presumably a Canadian operating company and it's held by a holding company in Canada. And of course, we understand that there's a deduction on, under uh, uh, the Income Tax Act that will provide for a tax-free dividend going from one corporation to another is commonly referred to as intercorporate dividends, and that's fine. I don't see any problems so far. What I would see as a problem here is, is that whether or not you have a company in the United States or in UAE, I would suggest that there would be several challenges there, one of which would be that the eligibility for the capital gains exemption would depend on all or substantially all of the underlying assets being actively used by a business in Canada as active a business asset. Well, these, first of all, are outside of Canada. So whether active or not won't matter. <laughs> That's one thing that occurs to me. The other issue that I would say is that uh, irrespective of what country they're there, that we're, we're using consideration should be given if we have active businesses as in, in other jurisdictions, uh, we need to be looking at issues such as withholding tax. We have to be considering whether or not there's any capability to bring uh, what's called exempt surplus. It's a Canadian tax term, which uh, basically applies if you have an active business. So as an example, if we have a US subsidiary or 
a subsidiary in Dubai or somewhere else, we'd say, well, does that meet the Canadian sniff test as an act of business or does it not? If it does, well, then quite likely uh, we, we could look at whether or not we can bring money back into Canada tax free. But we see too many of these kinds of structures. This is very, very common. Oftentimes they're not like four boxes, they're 40 boxes, spider web of companies. Nobody gave any consideration at all to the planning. And I'd say that uh, this is uh, like a little a segment of what I've seen a thousand and one times. And I, every time I see it, I wish I wasn't looking at it. So yes, I'd say that there's a whole bunch of problems there. So why don't we go on to the next slide? Sure. So the next slide just shows a possible structure that might be able to provide some solutions for some of the problems that, that Todd had mentioned. Um, did you want, Todd, did you want to shed some light just on how the use of a family trust, either in Canada directly or in another jurisdiction, might be able to add some benefits for the shareholder in this case? All right, first and of all, in, in, if you're considering doing any kind of planning that involves, um, you know, trusts and, and state planning considerations and so on, it's very important to really understand what the objectives are, okay? And if you're, you may have children that are active in your company, you may have children who are not, and it might be that you wanna treat them differently. It might be that, uh, you know, you've got a successful business and you've got, you know, significant portfolio, portfolio of real estate and so on. And the reality is that there's a significant cost to just allowing it to be that way and to do nothing else. Not only is there, potential uh, vulnerability to litigation, which could cause, in effect, attachment of your assets, including the shares. Many individuals do not consider the importance of asset protection, which I think we talk a lot about for the following reasons, that in the event that uh, uh, you hold the shares of a holding company and you know you end up being uh, named in, a, in an action, well, you, you may not continue to own those shares. And also, you can reduce the tax uh, remarkably on the uh, uh, future capital gain. So what we're looking at here is just, you know, a sample of uh, a bunch of boxes of a triangle. What it really means is, is, is you might be able to save tens of millions of dollars in tax. And it might be that uh, it's worth doing it. And it might be that once you consider that, uh, it might make a lot of sense. It also may be that there's capability for you to be able to plan your affairs so that a natural consequence could be a much lower annual tax rate uh, rather than in consideration of car and some of the other things we talked about. So I would say that uh, what you've got here as well is you've got uh, the use of financial instruments such as insurance. So where I'm going to say that starting off with the fact that we can move money tax-free subject to certain limitations from an operating company the bottom up to these holding companies, et cetera. We can then cap the growth in it so that the shares that are held by the parents, as an example, the family business, are frozen. All the rest goes to a trust where we have beneficiaries and there's asset protection jurisdictions. So let's just look at this as a blend between an architectural plan and I'm going to say an engineering plan. So I say that because I believe there's functionality in these plans. As an example, some of those arrows are generally in my world refer to uh, conduits, conduits that are used for purposes of moving money. So I can see that you've used insurance there. Insurance is very effective. And maybe Jordan, you can talk about how the insurance is being used and what the benefits yeah. are. Yeah, we, 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 don't, we don't have too much time, so I'll just be very brief, but I would say that really whenever an estate, when it, whenever an estate freeze is being instituted, really life insurance should, should also be a, quite a crucial um, part to be instituted within the type of structure. Um, there's various advantages that a corporately held life insurance policy would have over a personally held one, one of which is being able to pay for insurance premiums using uh, after-tax corporate dollars as opposed to personal dollars. And um, the uh, receival of a life insurance benefit also creates a capital dividend account that would enable the uh, shareholders in state to be able to access really the vast majority of a life insurance uh, policy's death benefit on a largely tax-free basis. And um, in addition to that, um, provided that the right policy is being used, um, it would normally be a, be a whole life or a universal life insurance policy. There are also opportunities to be able to receive either corporate borrowing or 
or personal borrowing for a company shareholder shareholder in that case by using the life insurance policy as as an asset to receive borrowing from a financial institution. But um, just really quickly, I think we should probably change subjects and speak uh, regarding some of the uh, some of the difficulties that uh, family businesses are encountering just in the in the current high interest environment and and also just sort of what are some solutions that uh, they can use to be able to receive capital yeah um all right we can talk about that because i think that's very significant um companies that are looking to expand uh, are faced with uh, it's kind of the same problem in effect as anyone who owns a home and has a mortgage or anyone that owns multi-residential real estate that is relying on cash flows, you know, based on uh, rental income. And also uh, the greatest cost seems to be the cost of capital nowadays. In a, I'd say that in a, you know, in, a, in an environment where you were paying two and a half percent at one time for interest, uh, now you're looking at, you know, seven to eight and a half percent, sometimes higher. Well, it really puts a lot of strain on uh, property holders. So there's distressed properties. There's also distressed property owners. And uh, I think it's no secret that inflation, particularly over COVID, has caused a, a real struggle on the average working person. There was a gentleman who was being interviewed on, on television the other day, and I was watching it, and he was a manager in a company. He felt very successful and so on. And he was saying he earns $26 an hour. And ultimately, as a manager in a company, this, and this is kind of typical of those of you that uh, have properties, uh, your tenants might be this man or people just like him. Well, he, his rent was only $500 a month. That was coming to an end. And the lowest price rent that he could find was $3,500 a month, meaning he could not afford to live there. So putting ourselves in the shoes of those uh, you know, individuals that are struggling, in order to uh, cover the high cost of food and clothing and entertainment, and lastly, but not least, the rent, uh, it means that you may have certain constraints. Not only do you have constraints with rent control, but if you have a building that doesn't have rent control, say the age of the building or some other reason, well, you're still limited to what extent people can afford to pay that, which really points to the whole issue of cost of capital being so darn high. Um, also, this applies, as I mentioned, to companies that are required requiring to go to the bank. Uh, typically, you go to a bank in Canada, and uh, if you need $100 million, they'll give you $30 million. So that's great. You get a third of what you need, maybe. Well, the bank's always talking about risk. Well, one of the big issues are it's the banks that are creating risks. And those of you who are at the bank, I know we've got uh, friends there from all the banks, um, at the end of the day, the concept of providing one third of the funding puts the project in significant risk. Not only that, but you're requiring that these individuals repay these loans within say three to five years. Well, that's additional risk. And by the time you pay the interest at seven or eight or 10%, well, you paid over half of the amount you got originally in interest. So what have you got left to make success? And if you're looking at launching a company, and, and you, you uh, or not launching a company, but uh, launching into new markets or expansion, global expansion and otherwise, you're faced with the same problem. You have PE funds and hedge funds and so on, who will come out and you know basically give you, again, a portion of what you need for the lion's share of your company. And then they give you the rest of it later, but you give away everything except for three or 4%. So you have not much left. So what I will say, there are solutions that are available where we have some uh, groups that we work with that are made up some top 10 banking people in the world, or top 10 banks rather, executives and people that ran these banks who have put together concepts that allow uh, individuals who are facing these problems to be able to solve the cost of capital problem. And this is very, very important. And very important for the survival of some of these companies and the advancement of some of the companies and to preserve the real estate portfolios of others. So in effect, first of all, this group is able to offer a cost of capital at a fraction of what you'd pay. So rather than paying, say, 7 to 9%, well, the, the cost of capital is as low as 2.25%. The highest I've seen uh, in this climate 
is 4.25%. Generally speaking, there's a 15 year loan. And unlike the banks who require you to repay the loan in a period of three to five years, it's a 15 year term. And there's no interest paid until the fifth year. There's no principal paid until the 15th year, right? So there are some solutions. Obviously there's an equity position that these companies take in, in these, uh, in these um, uh, situations. But one big difference is they provide 100% of capital required rather than 30. And the loans are non-recourse, meaning you don't lose, uh, you don't risk losing your house, your dog and your wife or your husband. Anyway, so that's all I wanted to uh, say about that for the time being. Uh, do we have any questions, Jordan, that we'd like to take care of? I noticed that we've come to the end of our hour here. Yep, we do, we do. And so we, we, we have two questions here that we can have, uh, have answered. And then after that, if anyone wants to raise their hand, they can, and we can uh, we can have their their questions played by audio too. So um, the first question that we have then is from um, from a shock, and so the question is uh, when a, I presume that's a Canadian controlled uh, company that's controlled 100 percent by one individual treats stock transactions as business income. Can the individual show personal stock transactions in his T1 as capital gain? Uh oh. Well, it's really a case by case basis, but based on if it's treated as business income, then then uh, it would be included as income ordinarily instead of capital gains. I, I, my my answer, my most common answer is it depends. Nobody likes it, <laughs> but as Andy said, it's really on a case by case basis. We really have to review that. So if you have a situation like that, we'd be more than happy to review it for you. In general, CRA likes to treat. Uh, like the gain from, from assets as income, which is taxed fully, and the taxpayer usually prefer capital gains, which is taxed at 50%. But yeah, it's really a case by case basis. Right. And so there is an anonymous uh, attendee that also asked a question. They asked if a financial advisor has incorporated their practice, is there a way to use the lifetime capital gains exemption if they sell their corporate shares that has their book of business in it? Yeah, well, I think really the question is, is the value in the intrinsic value in the individual or is it in the corporation? That's that's one of the things to consider. And I think the argument is not so much, you know, whether or not uh, there's a capital gains exemption, it's whether or not the company could be sold. Well, um, in my experience, which is rather limited, uh, I've seen that most a lot of financial advisors end up selling a block of business. So I'm not sure if that's applicable. Having said that, the eligibility requirement for the capital gains exemption really has a three part test. And I think it's very, very important that all business owners be aware of this. There is a holding test where you know an individual who is not related to the existing shareholder must not have held the shares for a period of 24 months. Uh, that does not mean that there's a requirement to hold the shares for 24 months. It means that an unrelated person must not have held the shares. Incidentally, that also applies to Treasury. Treasury is considered a person. <laughs> okay, so that's something that needs consideration. Another thing that needs to be considered is whether or not the assets of the company are actively used in the business or they not. So at the end of the day, uh, when you look at you know assets, uh, all or substantially all the assets must be actively used as we mentioned earlier, in the company in Canada. Otherwise, there's no eligibility for that. That's at the time of sale or disposition by uh, deemed disposition such as death. So that's also very important. Uh, we also, uh, there's also one more thing and that is for 24 months prior to the sale of the shares, principally all of the assets must be actively used. So the question really doesn't become, you know, whether or not we have a uh, advisor who, as a company that you know holds a block of business, because ultimately uh, that's something that I, I believe would be an active asset. But again, case by case, we look at everything individually, but knowing the rules is something everyone can do. The rules are not that complicated themselves. You don't need to know them inside and out. You don't need to be able to be judging, but you need it to be that radar that goes off, that red flag that uh, goes up and you say, okay, uh, maybe I need to question what's uh, what's being uh, told to me, or maybe I need to rethink this and get uh, other advice. 
And so um, just one uh, last question that I can see here is, uh, does the use of a non-resident trust in Barbados, for example, by a Canadian resident business, which would be the operating company, require mind and management to be in the offshore, offshore jurisdiction to still enable tax benefits versus a domestic family trust? Yeah, so that's a very good question. And um, in effect, it's a, an answer that we don't have a lot of time to give other than to say that where there's a trust in an asset jurisdiction, uh, protection jurisdiction, whether it be Barbados, New Zealand, Wyoming, UK, Alaska, Nebraska, there's a bunch of them. Well, whether or not the uh, trust is in one of those locations, uh, what is always important is that you have a legitimate control outside of Canada. So the answer is yes, you do need to have a control outside of Canada. Having said that, there are private trust companies who act as trustee, fiduciaries that act as trustees to administer these trusts who have legitimate control over the trusts themselves. So you might ask yourself, well, why on God's earth would I even think of letting someone in another country, such as Barbados or United States, who I don't know very well, administer my trust. Well, there's very good reasons for that. And of course, uh, part of it is the law of trusts and the fact that a trustee is not permitted to benefit from the assets of the trust, only the beneficiaries. The key is the beneficiaries of trust ought not to be having any control whatsoever over the trust. It should be that of the, of the trustee. But again, this is a very uh, detailed conversation. Um, but it, the, the, the fact is, is that we can achieve superior asset protection in these areas. Absolutely. Uh, there was one last question asking to give some examples of for for new mandatory disclosure rules. So I think we we, we touched on a couple, on a couple of them. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to pick on any concepts. I mean, because there's you know, and I could probably name a dozen of them. But what I did say earlier was you know when you're receiving a tax deduction for an amount in excess of the amount that you contributed. Another one is, I mentioned the term artificial. So again, um, I know that there's a lot of accountants and lawyers and so on uh, who um, are friends in our audience uh, who may have been involved in some of these uh, concepts in the past, doesn't make them wrong, but it means that uh, at the end of the day, you ask yourself those questions and is one of the main purposes from CRA's point of view going to be asset protection. So I, I also gave an example of having shares that are linked to stock, to currencies. Okay. Um, there's, there's, a, there's so many out there. Um, there's been software deals. There's been art deals. There's been all kinds of things. But um, at the end of the day, again, I think of the example I gave, sitting there with your advisors, pretend that the CRA is there with you. When the and, and if you do that, you'll do better. And so we also had some some guests that had uh, raised their hand just to ask a question like, orally, and so I would just give them the opportunity to uh, to, to un unmute themselves. So this would just be for uh, for Barbara who has who's raised her hand. So uh, Barbara, are you there by any chance? So if you'd. Uh, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, you can do that. Yeah, okay. Barbara's, Perhaps not, Barbara's there. not there. So May has also uh, raised her hand. So I'll, I'll just uh, enable you to speak as well, May, if you'd like to. Oh, Barbara's back. <laughs> no? no? No, no. I don't. May, are you there by any chance? Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think anyone is there, but uh, I think some additional questions have came in. Okay. So. We love questions. Love yeah, them. yeah. So I think that, so someone was asking about the, uh, the recording of the presentation. So the recording would be on the Quantum Business Law website for everyone to be able to see. And so that was circulated on the, on the original invitation as well. So you can find a link to this recording as well as recordings of our previous programs. But um, I think that's really all the questions that we have here. So um, on behalf of Quantum Business Law and, and Quantum Family Offices and all of our staff, we wanted to thank you for joining us on the program and uh, very much appreciate uh, 
your support and uh, we hope you to, we hope to see all of you at our next program which we'll be sending out an invitation shortly for during the uh, the month of September. And thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>